Welcome, ladies and gentlemen of the internet, to Man Buns and Jesus. I'm one of your hosts, Josh Laborious. Across from me, if you're watching the video, not very many people watch the video, but if you are watching the video, you see good old Ben Oschlager. If not, you'll hear his masculine, gravelly voice in just a few seconds. <laughs> and uh, this is season three. And this time, there's not an intentional, uh, ep- or there's not an episode number, and it's on purpose because we're doing another one off. So to tell you about that is my wonderful, delightful co host. The esteemed Reverend Benjamin Oschlager. Thank you very much, Josh. Uh, yeah, so today's uh, episode is inspired by a question that I got uh, a couple days ago, and it was from a non-Lutheran uh, member of my church's kind of extended community, uh, and she asked, "So the Lutherans fast for Lent?" And my answer was. Yeah, we don't necessarily do the whole fish on Fridays thing, but like we do it more of as as a recommendation than a necessity, but we do it. And uh, that got me thinking about like where some of this stuff comes from. Um, I remember we talked in uh, November, I think, or December about where Advent comes from. Um, So why don't we do something similar about Lent? Talk a little bit little bit about why it's a thing uh talk a little bit about where it comes from and uh talk a little bit about some of the traditions around lent um that we uphold or that we often use uh to kind of help our worship to increase our devotional um understanding of lent and engage us as we get ready for easter so that's um, not for me. And I think what might be good to start off with is just a, a basic definition of what when we say Lent, what what is Lent? What do we mean by that? Um and for any of you who are listening who maybe aren't like you, you weren't you haven't been in the traditional church, uh Lent is the 40 days leading up to Easter. And it starts with Ash Wednesday. And then it goes for 40 days till Easter. And if you go and you count those days, you might be that's that's more than 40 days. Uh, Sundays do not count. Sundays are not Lent in, like they're not part of the season of Lent. And what Lent is, it is a penitential season. So we say this is kind of a time to reflect on our sinful nature leading up to the celebration of Easter. So that fundamentally, that is what Lent is. Um, And I'm sure Ben is eager based on his exquisite Wikipedia research to talk about some of the traditions that have come along with that. You didn't think I was not going to include that your research was on Wikipedia, (laughs) did you? I followed the links. I did what my teachers told me to do in middle school. Uh, <laughs> not that Mr. Ross is listening to this at all, but if he is, shout out to Mr. Ross. Um, so I guess first and foremost, to talk to speak to why Lent is considered such a penitential season. I mean, we start with Ash Wednesday where we recognize our mortality, right? Um, you get the sign of, of the cross and ashes on your forehead. Um, you're reminded of the words uh, that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Um, and you're also in some, I guess, depending on what church you're at, some pastors will use something like um, repent and uh, repent and believe or, or re- repent and believe in, in uh, Jesus Christ. Um, just as a way to remind you of either your sinfulness or your mortality. And we go from there through this season where if you're following the lectionary, which I know, Josh, your church is not, uh, but the the assigned readings for a Sunday, um, which are really more recommendations than anything, because as Josh and I it's love more to... It's a trumpet, guideline. Yeah, you can't tell us what to do. So... <laughs> 
Um, as as you go through those, the majority of them are kind of stepping you toward Holy Week and stepping you toward Good Friday, stepping you towards Jesus' death. Um, a lot of it is the things that he's doing to prepare, either the teachings he's giving his disciples to speak of his own mortality, uh, his his coming sacrifice, um, or some of the things that those around him are doing. Um, this upcoming Sunday, which is going to be the Sunday after, or the Sunday before this comes out, the assigned reading is uh, Jesus raising Lazarus, Lazarus, uh, and uh, at the end we see the Pharisees start to scheme as to killing Jesus, um, and th there's a a lot of darkness and a lot of like kind of heaviness around this. And then the last day of Lent, um, it's a service that not a lot of churches do, um, but if you've ever experienced one, they're kind of haunting. Um, is an Easter vigil. It's the Saturday between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Um, and you are remembering that your God is dead. Um, there is hope in that as well, because we know that the next morning is Easter. But ultimately, it's pointing to the fact that God is dead. So why do we have this whole season around all of that? Um, and why 40 days? The big push in all of this is to remind us how much we need God and his provision in our lives. 40 days is a pretty uh, common fasting number uh, throughout scripture. Moses does it. Elijah does it. Jesus does it. Uh, I think there's other examples as well. Um, well. And you also get in the Old Testament when the Israelites are suffering the consequences of their sin after they leave Egypt they're about to enter the promised land and 10 of the 12 spies come back and they say, we can't like, we can't do this. They're, they're too strong for us. And Israel goes with them. Their punishment is to be in the wilderness for 40 years. Um, so there, there's also kind of that these, the figures that Ben mentioned use 40 days as, as like a penitential, but then there's also this 40 years that God uses to, um, essentially as a time of penitence for the entire people of Israel. So yeah, or you have the 40 days. Precedent. Yeah. Or you have the 40 days and 40 nights of rain uh, and the flood um, as Noah's on the ark, the, the rain waters and uh, the ground swells happen for 40 days. Um, it's, it's very much used as a sign of um, like, pointing people towards their reliance on God. Because all of these people who are fasting throughout scripture, they are withholding from themselves nutrition or um, food, whatever the purpose or whatever the thing may be, so that they are reminded that even as their body fails, even as their body weakens, they are still reliant on God for their ultimate source of life. That is beyond this one. Uh, if you look at the Israelites, they take 40 years so that the generation that doubts the, the authority and power of God can completely die. And the next generation that comes into the promised land is ready to trust in his promises. The 40 days and 40 nights that Noah spends on the ark watching the world drown, essentially, is a time where God is basically... Uh, hard rebooting creation. Have you tried uh, turning it off and turning it back on again? <laughs> Apparently, when God the did it, the flood is left... the IT person's <laughs> catastrophe, yeah. I suppose. Yeah, except that when God did it, he didn't hold down the power button after he unplugged it uh, because there was still a little bit of juice left and it ruined the whole thing again. Um, <laughs> That is a joke for like 2% of our audience, but I hope you enjoy it. Um, Keith, anyway. I'm, I'm specifically thinking of you. I imagine you would have enjoyed that joke that we, that meandering joke journey we just went on. 
Uh, Everybody else is like, what on earth are they? Where have they gone? And <laughs> when will they come back? <laughs> yeah. Um, when Jesus goes into the wilderness to fast for 40 days, he does so to put himself in the, the weakest possible position he can. Um, and to to prove his ultimate righteousness, even as one in flesh, right? Uh, that he cannot be corrupted, even though the flesh, the, the human nature of him is so weakened and so distraught because of the the kind of uh, kind of pain and suffering he's putting it through. Yeah. And so and we no, oh, go ahead. With with that, uh if I, I think I'm recalling correctly, but there was there's also some uh evidence, I suppose, that Jesus and his 40 days fasting leading up to the start of his public ministry would have been almost a precedent at the time. So it it means all those things that Ben was talking about for Jesus, but also there's some suggestion that that was standard practice, which like which adds to the significance of this, right? That mm -hmm. it's not just a few people who have been doing it, but it was so much there was so much meaning with this 40 days that it was common practice for people who were entering public ministry at Jesus's time, um, as best as we can tell, anyway. Fair enough. Um, so then as we get into Lent, um, oftentimes within the church here, we celebrate transfiguration right before it. So we see Jesus raised up in his glory before the disciples. And then we descend into this time of year where he is preparing to die. Um, and I think like the kind of fasting and, and ritual around it makes a lot of sense because it reminds us of who Christ is in his ultimate glory and authority. Like he's powerful enough that uh, we see Moses in the promised land uh, which he was told, you know, in this life, you're not going to get there. But then who shows up alongside Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration? You get Moses and Elijah. Um, and the disciples are like so in awe of this, that Jesus has the power to make these things happen. And then they go from there. They're not allowed to tell anyone anything. And we start, start to walk towards the cross. We yeah. do that in the church here, too. And, and Jesus completely lays aside his glory, his power to do this thing, to bring Moses and Elijah back to the promised land and have them appear to his disciples. And then slowly but surely, he starts to lay aside all of his glory, all of the things he could do to just snap his fingers and, and let it be done in order that he can be the ultimate perfect sacrifice. Um, I think there's kind of a cool image there, but yeah. And I, I was just thinking, I think tr the transfiguration is my most preached sermon in that I think I have preached on the transfiguration like six times i think i've done it every year since we were like certified to preach at the seminary so <laughs> my transfiguration comes up and i'm like oh gotta do this one again i'm already out of ideas i've only been out <laughs> for two years <laughs> um so kind of as we we talk about this journey to the cross that we take there are a couple of traditions that come to my mind that like this is this has been my experience and how we celebrate Lent. Uh, the first is that at almost every church I've ever been and Edgewater, the church that I'm at now is the exception. You have midweek services. Mm -hmm. So Ash Wednesday, you have a service for Ash Wednesday and then every Wednesday leading like through Lent, you have a, a Lenten service and a lot of times uh, there's an opportunity there for a sermon series where you'll walk through the penitential Psalms or you'll walk through the, the prophets with a special eye toward 
the prophecies that point us to the cross. There are series that look at Jesus's last words on the cross, which I think is jumping the gun a little bit. You're not letting Lent be Lent, but I, I get it. And those words do kind of warrant their own uh, sermon. So you have these Wednesday worship. If you're a member at Edgewater, or if you're somewhere else and you're like, well, why don't they do Wednesdays? The, the Fundamentally, the reason we do not do Wednesday worship every single Wednesday through Lent is because it costs us money every time we are in our worship space. So every Wednesday would cost, it adds to that bill and bluntly speaking, even at an established church, your attendance on a typical Wednesday night service is really low. You, you might like Ash Wednesday might be a pretty high service, but like for, especially the last Wednesday in Lent, you're you're getting a handful of people and our our logic is like if they're only going to be six or seven people worshiping it's probably not good stewardship for us to so what we do at edgewater is we we do our ash wednesday service and that is our celebration of lent and we kind of we celebrate the whole season on ash wednesday so that's one uh ash wednesday is a big one and I believe, uh, and we don't do this because we don't have a Christ candle. Maybe we should, but we don't. Um, I believe at many churches you don't light the Christ candle during Lent, or you're not I'm, supposed to. It depends on how well instructed the acolyte is. Um, I I mean, I've heard it different ways. I know a lot of churches that will light the Christ candle during the parts of the church here where Jesus is like in the world. So between Christmas and, and the resurrection, or between Christmas and Good Friday, and then from Easter to Resurrection Sunday, or not Resurrection, uh, Ascension Sunday. I can see that. that I can, so that's, that that's one I know. Um, I've actually never heard of churches not lighting the Christ candle through Lent. Well, maybe I'm maybe I'm off. In you, any I case, mean, you, you might be right. I just it might be a tradition I'm not aware of. Um. So you you have your Ash Wednesday, you have your Wednesday services, typically Sunday services, even though Sundays are not technically in Lent, the focus will still be on penitence. I mean, you won't hear I've the got, Alleluia's. I've got the uh, the official like hymn guide that the the synod puts out, and uh, Josh, I I'll picked a good pick. font for that. Third I'll Sunday you... in Lent. Yes. So Which is worth Sunday it's is not third technical. Sunday in Lent, not third Sunday of Lent. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, Lent, and then yeah. Lent will conclude, you'll have Monday, Thursday, which is a, it's a remembrance and it's a celebration of the institution of the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. At Edgewater, we don't do a Monday, Thursday service. Um, but Again, don't want to write a building. Yeah, in a perfect world, I would love to have a Monday Thursday service, and that's also the service that you would celebrate First Communion at for for like kids and and people who are coming into the church. So that's kind of a cool thing uh, to do thematically. And then that's Thursday, and then Friday is Good Friday, which I always I always switch Good Friday and Black Friday. Me too. Even though they're very very opposite things, but when you think about it. Jesus dying, it sounds more of that's a Black Friday kind of thing, but it's a good I Friday. Mean, the because, sun is blotted out for hours in the middle of the day. Yeah, it seems appropriate, but it's a good Friday because it is it is for our good. So Good Friday, you recognize the the crucifixion. And I love Good Friday because most churches will celebrate it with the rite of tenebrae, which is the rite of darkness. And you'll see there will typically be seven candles lit on the altar. There's there's not really anything. It's maybe draped with black, and then you have the seven candles. And throughout the service, candles are extinguished one at a time. And then if you have the capability, the room gets a little darker with every candle. And then when the last candle is extinguished, all the lights go out in, in the room. The pastor reads the last uh, the last words from the cross and slams the Bible shut. 
and it's it's very dramatic it's very powerful um and then you leave in silence so that's good friday and we do have a good friday service we do celebrate good friday because i think you can't really celebrate easter if you don't celebrate good friday um and that's something i picked up from my parents and then you have easter on sunday is is kind of most churches will have those those will be their lenten services and you end with your celebration on easter a lot of times you'll see there will be an easter breakfast and for whatever reason lilies <laughs> my church does the lilies and uh i learned last year that i'm highly allergic to them but they still ah, do good. good yeah i yeah had to blow my nose like 15 times during each Easter service last year. It was brutal. You know, there's this really cool thing, uh, fake flowers. And then you don't have to buy them every year. <laughs> you want to know something funny I just learned? It is written into our church constitution that we cannot have fake flowers in the altar. No way. Yeah. <laughs> well, enjoy allergy season <laughs> at Good Shepherd. Um, anyway, I, okay, this is still on that aside. I want to know what happened that caused Why that, that got into that. the Constitution? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if it even happened here. It could have happened at a church prior to this one from somebody that was part of the founding group here, and they were so insistent on it that everybody just gave in. I, I don't know. But uh, if I don't find out before um, before my time here is done, whenever that may be, that I will find out in heaven and it'll be uh, worth the wait. So <laughs> that's what big grand piece of knowledge do you want when you get to heaven? I want to know why there are only real flowers. <laughs> Mysteries yep. of the universe, meaning of life. Any, nope, nope. Flowers. Tell me. Yep. Why, why no fake flowers? Yep. Um, yeah. Uh, so then one other tradition that, that you didn't mention, Josh, that I think is really interesting in the, the season of Lent, um, there's a couple of things that kind of bounce off of it too, um, is fasting from the word Alleluia. Um, not a lot of I churches. I mentioned that. that. Did you? Very briefly, but yeah. Okay. I, I it was when you were starting to hold up your your little hymn book thing. Oh, okay. Lo siento. Um, it's okay. Jesus still loves you, and I'm trying. Thanks. Um, <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, yeah. So, depending on your church, a lot of churches uh, that are more traditional will refrain from using the word Alleluia. Um, and there are certain parts of the liturgy that you don't use during Lent because they're like too celebratory. Um, if if you use the the hymnal versions of the liturgy, you go. For what without... it's worth, we're not traditional, but we don't use Alleluia during Lent, other than when yeah. I'm it's saying it right now to say that we don't use it. Yeah, exactly. Then it's allowed. <laughs> um, if you're explaining why you aren't using it, then it's allowed. Then you're allowed to use it anyway. Um, I oh, shoot. The knights that say me just came to mind. What? The knights who say me. <laughs> oh, you said it. Ah, I said it. I said it again and again. Um, it's a Monty Python reference for anyone who missed the boat on that. Educate I'd yourselves. I watch the movie, but I don't know if we should recommend that here. Um, if, if you... If you are a mature adult, watch the, I think, well, I think it's rated PG-13, actually. I think that's because it predates R and because they re reestablished it after they included PG-13. Because I'm pretty sure it used to be just G and PG. Anyway, just, this is not important to our conversation about You're right. It's not. It's not. Use anyway. discretion when potentially viewing Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Yes. Um, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. So, um, 
probably is just a, a really high word of praise. And if you're in a season of penitential, uh, you know, thought and reflection, um, it, it just, it doesn't fit. Um, and there are, uh, like Catholic rites and Orthodox rites leading into the season of Lent, where they will literally take a sign with the word Alleluia, put it in the coffin and bury it for the month of Lent or for the season of Lent um, as a like sign of like, this is what we are doing. We are like burying our, our high joy. word of praise, our joy to really focus on the, the depth of what Christ went through to sacrifice himself for us. And the uh, seminary did something similar. The seminary would take all the banners with Alleluia on it, put it in a box, and like I think they stored it under the altar hmm. for the for the forty days of Lent. I'm sure someone listening can check me on that. But cool. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's so like that's the majority of the like kind of big Lenten traditions, at least the ones that we can think of and remember. Um, and fasting. This is this is the other kind of big one. Why do we fast in Lent? And it, again, refers back to the 40-day time periods that Scripture notes people went to fast. And Maybe we should define fast for anyone who thinks we're talking about going quickly somewhere. Yeah. So a fast is when you withhold something from yourself. Um, in most cases, when it's used in scripture, it is to def it defines a time where somebody went without food. Uh, as what Jesus did, uh, what Moses did, what Elijah did. Um but at other times, it just means to refrain from something. Like you can fast from, I could fast from Josh. That would be uh, a thing I could do. Probably uh, for your betterment, yeah. Uh, possibly, yeah. Um, Josh could fast from watching Predators games for the rest of the season, which again, might be to his benefit. Um, though they are like surprisingly close to playoff position, so. I, uh, we're not going to talk about that. I don't know what to do with all of that. Anyway, um, so fasting can be all sorts of things. Um, and the church historically used fasting during the month of Lent, again, as another way to point us to what Jesus went through as he prepared for his death on the cross. And as time progressed some of the requirements of that fast got pretty stringent um, to the point where like one of the main things that Luther did during the Reformation was push back against some of the fasting rules and fasting laws that uh, existed. For example, did you know, Josh, that during Lent, prior to Luther, you weren't allowed to eat butter? That's a problem. Yes. You have Luther to thank for the fact that you can have butter on your toast during the month of or during the season of one. Gee, thanks, Luther. <laughs> um but like some of them a lot of you probably know. Um the, the no meat on Fridays rule. Um that I used had a to roommate who followed that really, really badly. Yeah. And every year he would last like maybe the first two weeks before he was like, nah, I'm getting a burger. Um, was this a college roommate or was this Sean? Oh, it was a college roommate who okay. was Catholic. Okay. I, it's, it also kind of sounded like something that Sean might do, like fast for meat on Fridays and Lent, but I, had a lot more faith in his determination to like actually I was about follow to say, Sean Sean yeah. who, who's been on the show a couple times for our listeners Sean's pretty pretty self-disciplined yes yeah I was going to be very surprised that he couldn't make it if it was him but especially I'm if it was just not. Friday yeah 
I'm glad it's I'm glad it's not. Anyway, um, but that used to extend extend through the entire season of Lent. Um, and again, that was a like Christ gave of his flesh, so we shouldn't eat flesh, except when you're subsist like a subsistence uh living community. If you rely on hunting, then you can eat flesh. Or if you're a lion fishing, then you can eat flesh. That's where the exception comes from. So realistically, if you are Catholic, you are listening to this, and you didn't catch that fish that you're eating on Fridays, you shouldn't be eating it because that's against the rules. Which for all of our Catholic rednecks, you can consider that permission to go fishing on Friday to catch yeah. your fish and then or, eat. Or, or other times of the year and then freeze it and save it for Lent and Fridays. I I think that'd be acceptable too. Or if you uh, technically you could go deer hunting too and just save the venison for Fridays and Lent, that'd be allowed. There's all sorts of ways around this. You just got to be creative. Alternatively, um, you could just become Lutheran and uh, do what you want. We just lost any one of Catholic us. Audience one of us. <laughs> um, um, so with all of this, because. Ben's talking about food, but he, he had mentioned earlier, like people do all sorts of stuff and I'm going to tell a story that might, might be problematic, but we're going to tell. So here are some things that Lent, Lenten fasting can be good for. Mm -hmm. First, it can, it can provide you with additional time to focus. So kind of the original thing you could say well i'm not spending this time preparing food i'm gonna spend it in prayer and devotion instead or you know modern times if you give up say social media or you give up watching tv or like you there there was one year where i gave up video games for 40 days and you replace that time that you would be spending doing something else with devotional and that's like that's a really good thing to do to kind of hypercharge your devotional life for for 40 days um another thing is just fundamentally to experience suffering to realize that christ came came to this earth and he suffered being one of us for all those years and he suffered on the cross and his life was characterized by suffering and so we spend 40 days and we give up something that is a that is a pain to us and uh and we experience that suffering and in that line i actually i think there's some value to saying sundays are not part of lent and you break your fast on sundays because if you're doing it to like uh my younger brother gave up mountain dew for lent this year God bless and him. he said the first two weeks were really rough like he had caffeine headaches that kind of stuff but uh his body got used to it and i and for stuff like that i'm like well if you break your fast on sunday and you have some like mountain dew or whatever on sunday it's gonna suck for all 40 days because your body's not getting used to the new so if you're doing it to experience suffering well <laughs> maybe you do break your fast on sunday so that you keep suffering uh, <laughs> and then the other thing i've seen that might be good but i think is also has some problems is people use it to remove temptation. Mm. Like there's something, there's a vice they have and they give up this vice for 40 days. And it's like, um, maybe you should just give it up yep. entire. <laughs> like if you drink too much and you say, I'm not gonna drink for Lent, it's like, well, maybe you just, maybe you just stop drinking period or you stop drinking yeah. too much uh, depending on where your self-control is at. What Lent in fasting is not for is a diet plan, which, and here's my story. Uh, so in high school, I was sitting, we were sitting in Bible class on Sunday morning, and we started every Bible class by going around and doing highs and lows, which for anyone who's not familiar, you share something good from your week, you share something bad from your week, a high and a low. So we we're going around and there were, there were four or five girls in a row who their low was that they had given up chocolate or desserts or something for Lent. And it was, it was a diet 
thing. It wasn't a like a penitential thing. It wasn't a devotional thing. They were giving up sweets for 40 days as like a 40 day diet. And this gentleman who was after them, who, as you'll hear in a second, didn't have a great filter. I'm not going to name him. I'm not going to do that. But he looked at them dead serious. And he's and this gentleman was a different. He was not white. That's important because he looks at these five white girls and he says, I'm giving up racial tolerance for Lent. And he was making a point that like you guys are this is you're doing like you're doing this for the wrong reasons. So I'm going to make this as ridiculous as I can. Um, and I, I kind of resonated with him a little bit. I'm like, well, yeah, you're right. You, their reason their like their, their fasting was from a bad place and yours was from a, from a bad place. I just, I always thought it was funny because he was, <laughs> he was giving up racial tolerance and most of the other people in the room were a different race than he was. Uh, so that's, if you're going to give up something for Lent, don't do it just for a diet. If you want to do a diet, fine, do a diet, but don't say you're giving it up for spiritual reasons. You're, you want to lose a couple pounds. Like, that's fine. That being said, I do think it is possible to give up sweets for Lent and have it be a genuine thing. Because, like, if you even think back to the, the origin of some of this, um, the reason that Mardi Gras exists... Fat Tuesday! The day where you just eat to excess... Um, do you guys have punch keys down in, in Cali? I don't even know what that is. So okay, no. Never mind. It's basically like the most uh, obscene, fatty, sugary donut you've ever experienced in your life. Um, and uh, they they intentionally use a lot of butter and a lot of sugar because those were ingredients that you had to give up during Lent before. A lot of the Catholic control around laws uh, went away. So you would just use up all of your like ingredients that were banned during Lent and eat them all so they didn't spoil while you were fasting. Uh, part of that, so that, that part was certainly practical. But then also part of it was you are experiencing like the luxury of luxuries for like a 24 hour ish period where you are just enjoying all of life's pleasures within reason, unless you're at New Orleans Mardi Gras, then maybe not within reason. Uh, and then you have to cut cold Turkey and you were kind of talking about this with your brother's mountain dew fast, right? After a couple of weeks, he gets used to it. But if you experience like the high of the highs of, of just overindulging, to the max, there is going to be a significant like change in uh, what you're experiencing within 24 hours. You go from that to you are dust and to dust you shall return. Right? And as uh, the pastor is putting that on your forehead, he's aggravating your hangover. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if you spend your Mardi Gras in New Orleans. Or anywhere where they have a decent Mardi Gras um, or carnival or whatever it's called in your part of the world. Because I think in our, for our Brazilian uh, listeners, all five of them. Um, Which is still be. crazy that we have five Brazilian listeners, but you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, George. Uh, uh George, if you ever want to be on the podcast, let us know. We'd love to have you. Uh, all that being said, like, I'm pretty sure they call it carnival uh, or carnival. They can do what they want. Um, but then you, you experience that drop off. You experience the, the utter lack of anything like self-indulgent or comforting. Um, and it really, really changes the, the, the feeling of everything. So if your brother wants to do a Mountain Dew fast again next year, tell him to drink a 12-pack on Fat Tuesday and then to cut cold turkey. Yeah, I think you misunderstand uh, what a normal intake would 
B and how much would would be considered excess? Okay, yeah, maybe a 24 pack. You're getting closer. <laughs> um I'm I'm assuming this is Ian. No. Really? I thought Caleb's yeah. addiction was Dr. Pepper. Caleb's uh Caleb is Dr. Pepper. Uh I have four brothers, my guy. That's Ian, right. Ian doesn't have uh, an addiction to soda, just to Scooby Doo cartoons. So this and is the one I have met then. Yeah, well, one of them, yes. Okay. No, I met I met he, your youngest brother. Oh, I then yes, it's the one you haven't met. Okay. Sorry to um, the one I haven't met. I forgot you existed. <laughs> <laughs> uh some other things like if you're looking I, it's a little late in the game now but if you're trying to look ahead to next year some other things that i i think is a good maybe modern take on lent is instead of sacrificing something add something mm -hmm. which i mean you could you could read that as i am sacrificing time mm -hmm. um but when maybe going through lent you say i'm going to read a book of the bible every single day and you're going to sacrifice that half hour to an hour, depending on what books you have selected. Um, and you're going to, in the 40 days of Lent, you're going to read through the entirety of the Bible, right? And you add that, and that's not really sustainable long term, right? You probably can't read, spend that much time reading every single day. Maybe you can, in which case, you know, great Good go for you. it but um and maybe for let you say i'm gonna i'm gonna make this sacrifice of some of the other things i do to to really get into it. or you say through the 40 days of lent i'm gonna sit and i'm gonna pray 30 minutes every day or i'm gonna sit and i'm gonna pray for an hour every day and you set that time like so you could or maybe kind of on a more fundamental level those are for people who are really looking to push the envelope. Maybe you say during Lent, I am going to be at church every single Sunday. And you make that commitment to if you if you don't regularly go, if you're there, maybe three out of four Sundays a month or two out of four Sundays a month or once a month, you say for Lent, I'm going to be there every single Sunday. And you make that addition. And that's a little bit of a lower threshold one. Um, but maybe that's maybe that's your Lenten practice. You find something to your and you add it to your spiritual life. And maybe it's something that wouldn't normally be sustainable for you. But for the 40 days, you make it work. Um, and that's something I've seen and I've practiced a couple times that I, I think can. Can fit really well with the with the theme of the season, with the, mm -hmm. with the spirit of the season. So that's think, another direction you could take it yeah. if, if that's a route you want to go. I think reasonably anything that you're adding that could be considered a discipline, something that you're doing that's hard, that's setting aside time, that's setting aside comfort, um, that's pushing you, I think would be within the spirit of the season. Uh, I once gave up not working out for Lent. Um, <laughs> It worked. Fair play. Um, fair play. I spent most of Lent really sore. Um, and you know what? Good Friday hurt. Easter Sunday was a lot of fun. Because for the first time, it, it had actually been like 45 days at that point, because I didn't even take off Sundays. Um, I actually rested for a day. And boy, did I pig out. <laughs> But like, uh, it was it was something that reminded me, like, I've got to be dedicated to this. I got to be dedicated to something. Um, and I spent a lot of that time, like, listening to um, the Psalms as I'm working out too, so just to to tie it back into uh, kind of a devotional component. That's hold on. For for those of you who aren't weightlifters, who aren't gym people, we you there's a term for people who they are in the gym, no headphones, they're not on their phone between sets, they just wait. 
and we call them uh, demon slayers. Because you look at a person who is on the weight bench and they are just sitting there waiting for their next set. And the response is they are fighting demons in their head, right? Like that person, a whole different level of discipline. You have no music motivating you. You have nothing occupying your head. You are just thinking of the next set. I imagine like that kind of demon demon slayer. And then I'm going to listen to the Psalms. That's a whole different level because that's like... <laughs> That could be a relaxing thing, and you're having to work past the relaxation that that's bringing you in it. Oh man, yeah, and that's a whole different level of discipline you were working with. Jeez. I don't know how I got through that. That was my vicarage year, so and that was also during COVID. Um, so it was it was rough, but I did it. Uh, made it. <laughs> I'm. I should do that again next year. That was a good. Anyway. Um, all that being said, like find, if you're going to add something, make it a discipline of some kind, um, like adding, I'm going to cook dinner for my family, um, to me is borderline, but adding, I'm going to cook dinner for my family and do all of the dishes. That's a discipline. That's a level of service. I think that would be a, an appropriate fast for Lent. Yeah. Or kids say you're going to do the dishes every night. Yeah. Or parents who are listening, you could share that with your kids, see how they receive that. <laughs> but uh, so there, there are plenty of options if you want to approach a, a Lenten fast in an appropriate way or even, yeah. and, and we don't have to spend much time on this, but, Fasting in general can can be a worthwhile thing to do, mm -hmm. and it doesn't always have to be forty days, and it doesn't have to be dirt. Like if you say you have a big decision coming up, and you do like a seven day fast to lead up and and before your decision, like I could see that being a, an incredibly worthwhile experience, um, mm -hmm. or or something like that, or you've had a really busy time in life or you feel like you've been struggling in your faith a lot and you say, I'm going to yeah. take the next seven days and we're, and do a fast like we've been talking about. Um, there's, there's space for that. And I think there's, there's probably something pretty helpful about that. Yeah. So. And uh, another one more kind of fast that I would throw out there. If you do want to try fasting from food, um, I know people who will fast for a day. Um, I think that's that can be a worthwhile uh, thing. Um, I like 40 hours because it's not 40 days, but you keep the the, the theme, the, the numeric theme. Um, it basically is from breakfast of day one to lunch of day two. Is your fast or no from breakfast of day one to dinner of day two is your fast um and it pushes you and pushes the limits of what you think you can do but at the end it's pretty rewarding and you spend your meal time in prayer and scripture it's a pretty good, I think it's a pretty good timeline. I would agree so. with that. With that, I think uh, takeaways, are we ready for takeaways? Sure. Um, I can start. and Go for it. I guess. Uh, my takeaway is that Lent is a time to seriously reflect on our relationship with God thinking about what it would be like without Jesus and then kind of some gratitude for what it is like because of Jesus. So um, do take steps in your life to, to recognize it, even if that is just you're going to church during Lent, but mm -hmm. 
do something in your life to recognize the season. Yeah. And I think my takeaway is probably Lent is cool. Uh, like there's a lot of thought and a lot of history into or behind why it exists, what it is, why we do it. Um, and I would encourage. It's going to be our episode title, by the way. Lent is cool. Thanks. Uh, I would encourage those of you who made it this far. If you're still interested in this stuff, seriously, just go poke around uh, on the old interwebs or, um, you know, find a book or something on on where all of this stuff comes from. Because there's a reason that we have these traditions and they are to help our, our practice and help our faith. And if we understand why we're doing them, I think it can really help us grow in our understanding of who God is and what he's done for us. So Lent is cool. Lent is cool. If you have someone in your life who's been asking questions about Lent or might be curious about it, go ahead and send them a link to this podcast. Uh, and if you have received this podcast from a friend, thank them because you obviously valued it enough that you listened to the whole darn thing. So say, hey, thanks for sending me that podcast. And then subscribe. If you're listening and you haven't subscribed, I would say, why not? Go ahead and subscribe on whatever your favorite podcasting platform is. It helps us see that we're doing something that people find worthwhile, which is is good for for both of us and any insecurities we may or may not have. Um, we are on all the big podcasting platforms, Spotify, Pandora, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iTunes, which is Apple Podcasts whatever uh i heart radio yeah, it and... hasn't existed for five years josh get with the times well android sir i mean anyway me too, but i still know and i know i just don't care enough to get it right it, anyway we're on all those places we also do have a facebook page it gets checked occasionally uh the facebook page is there so if you if you don't know us personally and you want to reach out to us you can and you might say why would we reach out to these two random podcast hosts uh well you'd reach out if you have a question or a comment or if you have a topic you want us to tackle like today's topic kind of came from someone who who had a question um or if you want to come on you want to see if we can get a certain guest host all of those things would be reasons to reach out and finally uh, go to church on Sunday, and if you're in the in the Ontario Eastvale area, come to church at Edgewater. We'd love to see you. And uh, if you're in the Lake Orion, Michigan area, check out Good Shepherd, and Ben will take good care of you spiritually. So, with that and all of our shameless plugs out of the way, I believe it is time to tell you to go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.